Welcome everybody to the Student Advocacy and Empower, Moving Fast and Driving Meaningful Change at UT Austin. I am Cynthia Henry and will be moderating this session. I am adding the links to the various support um, services offered. Let me just drop that in there real quick. Um, offered by the conference, as well as the link to the Code of Conduct, um, which is in effect for all conference events. And now I'll hand it over to the presenters. Thank you very much. Bear with me just a moment while I share my screen with you. All right, wonderful. Hopefully you are seeing it. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ashley Morrison. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Talker Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. My responsibility is to drive the awareness and adoption of OER and other types of free and affordable course materials across our campus. I am joined today by two exceptional former students, and I'll let them each introduce themselves. All right, hi everyone. My name is Rohit Prasad. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I just graduated from UT Austin in May with a degree in biology, um, and I was UT, the president of UT's Natural Sciences Council, which we'll get into, um, and I'm currently a first-year medical student at Cell Med School, also at UT Austin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Shaw. I also just graduated with a degree in biology. I am currently working as a chemistry specialist for the chemistry department at the University of Texas, and I'm applying to law school currently for next year. Thank you both for introducing yourselves. You can see that I am joined by two very talented, ambitious individuals um, that I had the pleasure of working with closely over the last two years. And that's what we're here to share with you today. We're gonna tell you about the work that we've been doing um, driven by student leaders like Alex and Rohit. And we'll discuss how they've translated interest across our campus from students to legislative action related to affordable course materials how they've scaled data collection related to students, course materials affordability concerns, and initiated conversations with administrators on our campus. We'll also share an overview of some of the specific programming that we've used to recognize and encourage faculty adoption of OER together. And finally, we'll discuss how this long-term work is sustained as student leaders graduate through thoughtful legacy planning. We do anticipate having plenty of time at the end of the presentation for Q&A, but you're more than welcome to share your questions in the chat as they occur to you, and we'll come back to those at the end. I want to start by just talking a little bit about UT. Uh, the University of Texas at Austin is a public land-grant institution. It's designated as R1 for a high level of research output. And we've got 18 colleges and schools that collectively have more than 300 degree programs. Each semester, over 12,000 courses are on offer. So that says a little bit about the challenges of scaling outreach on this campus. Um, we have about 51,000 undergraduate and graduate students. Out of those, more than 34,000 receive some form of financial aid, and about 10,000 are Pell Grant recipients. And that's a number that's growing each year, too, which is one of the reasons why UT Libraries is so invested in OER and course materials affordability initiatives. But what you've come here to learn about today is the work that our students do to advocate for OER. And I'm going to turn it over to Alex to share more about why our student leaders have been engaged in this work. Hi, everyone. So I wanted to give some background essentially on how this sort of happened and what personally went through our minds. I guess we decided that this was something that we wanted to work on. Um, so the way this actually got started was right around when COVID happened, um, at least on my end, which would have been spring of 2020 um, or fall of 2020. And I'd actually just taken organic chemistry at um, UT. And I realized after taking the final that there was apparently an entire solutions manual that you could purchase that was where most of the test questions had come from. So I realized then, I guess, that there were definitely advantages to being able to purchase those types of things. And I realized that there was just a really big difference in the experience of students who had the resources to buy everything and just, you know, look for any advantage they could. And the students who maybe are only able to afford, if even able to afford, the bare minimum for course materials. 
Um, so the reason that we invest in these initiatives is there really is a demonstrated need and difference in the students' experiences. And it's really not fair. Um, you know, students come to college to try and be able to get an education and have opportunities. And it's really not great to see when there are things like this that are just systemically disadvantaging students, students over time. Um, so student leaders invest in OER initiatives because we really do think that this is the way to um, make education more equitable and give students those opportunities. And we also think that there is plenty of you know, precedents in the past that this is something that students do care about, students do want. And as we're hoping to show you guys today, this is something that we can to some extent achieve. It just takes progress over time and continued effort. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide, Ashley. So for what UT students say, we just wanted to highlight some of these quotes. These were actually gathered during um, some different things that I believe Rohit will be talking about later, but the students were just talking about some of the various expectations for their classes. And I think it's easier when you look at one class to sort of justify a hundred dollar textbook or something like that. But when you consider that most students have five, six courses a semester, it really adds up quickly. So we just wanted to point out some of the highlights uh, from what students said. So one student mentioned that their intro business class required them to purchase a textbook and all these other required materials. And it was a lot of money at the end. Um, and they said that this was for basically all of their required classes or just non optional classes. And it was an essential part of the course. So um, there were things like that being said, a number of students mentioned how, you know, I paid for tuition already, why am I being expected to pay, you know, upwards of $600 a semester, possibly on materials. And then we also heard some where students even dropped classes because of the textbooks. And this was really upsetting, of course. Um, like I said earlier, you know, you want to come to university so you can have these opportunities and learn these skills you maybe couldn't at home. So it's really unfortunate when you see things like this where students are being gate kept, so to say, from these courses and from these classes they need because they can't afford it. Um, lastly, there was also just some students who talked about um, that they needed to purchase brand new materials rather than even having a used option and that it was just once again a large financial burden on them. Um, and they said also that students don't receive scholarships until the 12th day of class. So there were even situations where students are in a class, they plan on taking that class, but during class time are being, you know, kept from having equitable access to the material. So we wanted to highlight some of those experiences since Everyone knows college is expensive, but I do think sometimes it's easy to picture the broke college student as a population or a stereotype and forget that it is very real people who are affected by these things. And it's very real people who you may have a student in your class or run into someone who can't afford food that day or can't afford their books and has to make that decision. So next up, um, to provide a bit more background, I wanna talk about some data collection that we did. Um, and this data was really a cornerstone of our advocacy work. Um, and we'll get into a bit later about how we specifically incorporate this into our work. Um, but I wanna start off now just giving a little bit of insight into some data that we do have collected. Um, so where we got this data from is every two years, um, UT's student leaders conduct a massive campus-wide surveying initiative um, to assess student priorities related to tuition and budgeting, um, given that for our case, every other year is a tuition setting year. Um, we like to survey students to get their input on anything and everything related to tuition, budgeting, finances, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this past year, we were very intentional to include some questions um, about the costs of course materials and some potential solution. Um, and I wanna highlight a few key data points here and, and it can't exactly read the, set, um, the legend there, but I'm gonna read out some of the key points to y'all. Um, so firstly, you can see we asked how often course materials prevent students from accessing required materials. Um, we had about a little over 3,900 responses um, and over 75% of those answered that either sometimes, often, frequently, or always. Um, and that really indicates that really more than three quarters of the students that we surveyed um, are impacted in at least some way by the cost of the course materials that are being placed upon them. Um, now, when asked how they deal with the high cost of course materials, uh, if you see that on the right side, we had a little over 4,100 responses um, and almost 50% said that they just don't buy the required materials, meaning that they're potentially missing out on key resources needed to succeed. And I think this is a really important point too, um, to emphasize that when coming up with like the cost of course materials, a good chunk of students are just not paying and are not getting what they need to succeed. 
um, which you know could down the road be harming their ability to learn. Uh, but that's a sacrifice that a lot of students are making. Uh, and then finally, when asked if students think that faculty should be recognized for using free or low cost course materials during the tenure and promotion process, over 70% of the 1,000 respondents indicated yes. Um, so I want to really touch base on that point too, because getting OER, free and low cost course materials, um, considers tenure promotion, I know is a much broader and bigger conversation. Um, but this is the first time that we've seen student opinion on that, and it was overwhelmingly um, that it is something that students value and like to see in that process. Um, so like I mentioned, this data really gives us a solid starting point to target our advocacy, um, but we'll get into a bit later on how exactly we're using this. Um, so moving on to the next section, we're gonna be talking broadly just about how student leaders at UT have invested in OER initiatives, um, starting off with just some background on how the work got started on our campus. So I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so back in spring of 2019, I was still a freshman at the time, it's been a while working on this, um, but the university-wide Senate of College Councils, which is a collection of all of the um, student councils from each of the colleges at UT, um, they got together and they essentially contacted um, UT's OER working group um, to solicit feedback on some draft legislation, so student legislation. Um, in support of OER, because that was when students were really identifying OER as a potential solution for, you know, the rising costs of course materials. Um, so then moving on to fall 2019, um, we basically took that initial momentum and then we used it to try and make a more specific strategy. And so we passed another piece of legislation um, about creating a faculty award for OER. Um, so that we'll get into next slide in a bit, but I also want to point out how state legislation that I'm sure many of you are, you all are familiar with um, surrounding OER reporting and things like that just led to greater conversations amongst faculty and administration, which really helped us sort of get in the door and get their ears like listening um, to kind of push OER advocacy. Um, so going on to the next slide. Uh, so for um, the evolving approaches to OER advocacy, as Ro had kind of alluded to, and as you may have noticed just how things have changed over time, um, we really did start with a different goal or not necessarily a different goal in mind, but a different plan, path in mind, however you want to say it. Um, so in fall of 2020, um, this was shortly after when I mentioned like organic chemistry and realizing you could purchase all the answers. Um, I initially approached Rohit um, through Natural Sciences Council about discussing like a spending limit for uh, classes. Um, so at first we were like, you know, maybe we require it to be that you can't spend over $50 for a course or a professor can't ask students to spend more than that. Um, that was a little idealistic and optimistic since that got shut down like immediately. Um, so we realized that it was going to be a bit of negotiating and diplomacy um, between our student advocacy and um, campus administrators. So that was a good learning experience early on. And I think it's something that is important to keep in mind um, just because you don't wanna have eager students who are wanting to help getting shut down the first time and then just quitting, right? So being prepared for that sort of back and forth and knowing how to approach that, I think is a really important aspect of leading these conversations. Um, so at first we discussed that. And then in spring of 2021, we focused towards um, sort of rewarding positive practices and trying to put tools in the hands of students. Um, and we can talk about this more in the legislation, but specifically what this meant um, was we wanted to create programs like the Affordable Education Champions and things like that, which we will speak more on, um, that would essentially reward professors who are doing good work. Um, my personal connection to this is that um, I work for the chemistry department at UT currently, um, and I was a teaching assistant for the past three years um, in that course. And we actually, we have between 2,000 and 3,000 students every year, and we do not use a textbook at all for the course. So the course is nearly free um, for students. And it's because our professors and our teaching team at UT have put together a completely free textbook like on their own time over the years. So I was like, this is perfect. Why can't we do this more? And that's when we realized that there's not a ton of structures in place currently to necessarily reward um, professors and faculty or really anyone who puts the time into creating these types of resources. So 
we realized that that was an important aspect of this advocacy because we needed to try and find ways to motivate faculty and give them rewards for these positive behaviors. Um, additionally, as far as increasing awareness, we talked about sort of putting the tools back in students' hands so that they can make informed decisions um, about which classes to take. So we'll talk about that some more, but the takeaway from this is just realizing that even though our direct goal is to you know, make classes and course materials more accessible, there are multiple paths and ways to accomplish that goal with students and getting creative has been a large part of our process in trying to find solutions. Um, and then just continuing on, after we discussed um, with faculty as far, or after negotiating with administration about motivating faculty, um, we decided to sort of go ahead with that plan of saying, we're gonna try and put things, um, systemic plans, and that would allow us like over time to continue to reward professors for those efforts. Um, and then we'll talk some more about how we've continued that over time, but sort of thinking of this as far as like a plan and having a goal in mind with various different approaches to it has definitely been a very valuable part of how we've accomplished what we have accomplished so far. And I think it's something very valuable for you guys to keep in mind if you're thinking of taking this back to your campus. We can move on to the next slide. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, um, campus legislation is one of the biggest ways in which students can directly advocate for issues um, and get certain topics to the attention of administrators. Um, and so it's something that we've used strategically to advocate for specific issues. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the first two kind of pieces here. So Senate Resolution 1808, um, that was back in late 2018 um, where it was really the beginnings of student advocacy surrounding OER and course material affordability, um, because that's when students really started to try to figure out what do we think is the best way to bring down the cost of course materials. Um, and that's when OER had really kind of come to the attention of student leaders. Um, so they passed a piece of legislation that's pretty broad, just in support of efforts to expand OER through UT libraries, um, not really knowing what direction that would take. Um, so coming up on SR 1911, so that was back in fall 2019, like I mentioned earlier, fall into spring, um, where building off of the original uh, proposal just in support of expansion of OER, um, we honed in specifically on the creation of an OER faculty award program. Um, so that was again in partnership with UT Libraries um, and was just before the time that Ashley got brought on board, I believe. Um, and so that was really when we sort of started to set the direction of how we're going to take our advocacy work. Um, and since then we've evolved into kind of more targeted strategies um, that Alex is gonna talk about with the next two pieces. So I briefly mentioned this in the evolving approach slide, but so SR 2103, a resolution in support of requiring that low course status be displayed on the university course schedule. Um, this was a piece of legislation where we quote unquote, we're trying to put the tools back in the students' hands. What this was, was um, essentially putting into our registrar a specific symbol next to courses that would be um, either less than $40 or free. Um, and the reason we did that was so that way students could essentially look and see, you know, have some sort of an idea of how much these courses are going to cost. And the way that we put this together was basically we said that if it is required to achieve the maximum grade in that course, um, we want it to be considered um, a material and part of that $50 total or that $0 total, whatever it is. Um, the reason for this is just so that way students, like I said, can plan their spending. And frankly, the other goal of this is that professors know that students want to save money. So we, we believe that this would in theory um, motivate professors to try and get their course materials to be less than $50 or free or wherever they can land in that range. And the reason for that is so that way over time, if professors are in theory, having less attendance because their course is expensive, then maybe they would consider if they should be trying to make it cheaper or, you know, it just brings these conversations to the table and we're hoping that it'll create change over time. Um, so that was the first piece that we did or that I mentioned. And then SR2201 is where we started to put into concrete terms um, a way that we could link um, accessibility to promotional materials. And what this was, um, this actually kind of took a really long time of negotiating with me, Rohit, and faculty 
um, at, on campus. So thank you to him. But what this is, is that in our promotional materials or the portfolio that professors have to put together when they're applying for promotion, there's all these personal statements that I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with, but there's nothing actually that ask professors to communicate what they are doing in the classroom to try and make their classroom more accessible for um, all students. And this has been something that has, you know, been stated and like posted about and things like that by our university in many ways is how they're committing to accessibility and things like that. So looking at things like that, where our, our university says they're committed to these things, and then saying, well, are you really that committed, you know, or where is this commitment being shown? Um, looking for things like that is sort of how we were able to put this together and approached um, the university and said, you know, if you guys are committed to accessibility, then we would like it to be that a professor needs to discuss what they're doing to make their classroom more accessible um, on a day to day basis. And the reason that we thought this is really good and flexible and something to consider maybe at y'all's campuses is that it's not too restrictive on professors or on administration, but it just offers the avenue for these conversations to be had. And I think that's a really creative approach that has helped us be a little bit more success or successful. Um, because as I'm sure you guys are all aware, campus doesn't want to change that much or they want to have control, understandably, but saying, well, we can create you know, a creative solution where you can still maintain control. We just want these conversations to be had has helped us be a little bit more successful. So this is currently about to be implemented in our college and then hopefully this can be expanded to the rest of the university but like i said it's just a short paragraph or statement where professors can talk about what they do in their classroom either you know whether it's recording their classes for students who have jobs keeping their classes cheap for students who you know may not be able to afford things or even if they you know have closed captions or a translator or anything but like I said, it's not about trying to rein professors in or make rules for them. It's just trying to create these incentives so that way professors see, you know, student success or student accessibility as part of their own success and helps them over time realize that this is something they should be caring about. I think we're ready for the next slide. Um, so I do want to emphasize kind of going into this that what we saw on the last slide was actually a progression to starting off from a broad general idea to really getting tangible changes, um, even on issues that seem to be really hard to move, including tenure and promotion, where we have, we're starting to see some movement on that. Um, and so now I kind of want to get into kind of specific strategies that we've used to get from point A to point B um, and really move from this broader idea to specific tangible actions. Um, and I also want to kind of present this as a framework for you all to take back to, you know, your campuses. Um, to approach advocacy work uh, surrounding OER, but really student advocacy in any way. Um, so it's kind of, I've framed it as like a repeating cycle. So starting off with establishing student need. Um, so that's when I talk about collecting data. So both qualitative and or quantitative um, about how course material costs burden students. So it's like the data I talked about earlier. Um, and it really establishes that this is something that students have see value in. Um, and that is a really powerful starting point to go off of because if you can establish that students care about it, that students value it, um, then you're really gonna be able to make a lot more inroads later on. So after you've established the need, you wanna generate specific asks. So moving to more tangible things from a broader goal. Um, so this is when you kind of come up with specific actionable policy changes. Um, and those are really going to be specific to the needs of your students and the kind of environment of your campus. Um, so for our, uh, our environment, we basically started off with how are we going to bring down course material costs? Um, and we work to see what are the best ways that we can reach students? What are the specific challenges that we're facing on our campus? Um, and that led us to course catalog designations, tenure and promotion considerations, faculty grants. The things that we've been talking about already. Um, and we identified those as a like key goals that we can, or strategies um, that would really help to increase OER adoption, drive down course material costs. Um, so now that we have you know, a need and we have specific things, how do we make them happen? So the first thing is we wanna generate attention around these things. Um, so recognizing existing work. And this is kind of a key thing that we, the three of us here started a couple of years ago um, in a program that we're gonna highlight pretty heavily in the following slides. 
Um, but basically there's there was faculty work being done around these issues all across campus. And what we wanted to do is connect that work with student need and student value. So really recognize that work to get people talking about it, get people understanding it and get the faculty who are already doing it to feel appreciated and continue with it. Um, and by emphasizing that students place value on these changes, um, the goal was to drive more faculty adoption and drive more faculty changes too, um, even from sort of like bottom up level. Um, following that, we went to engage faculty stakeholders because at the end of the day, it's really gonna be the individual faculty who are making these shifts and restructuring their courses um, to bring down those costs. So we started by, like I mentioned, recognizing the work, showing appreciation for faculty are doing that. And then we took that, so we took the student data and the faculty recognition, and we essentially leveraged that to advance conversations with faculty leaders. Um, so we approached the faculty council at our university um, showed them, hey, this is something that students care about, and this is something that, you know, faculty are being recognized for, too. Um, and we approached departmental faculty, so department chairs, um, associate chair, or associate deans within our college, faculty council on a university-wide level, really getting faculty buy-in using what we've established, because they're the ones that are going to be driving the changes. And now, once we've established the need, we've collected the data, we've started recognizing the work, and we have some faculty buy-in, um, we want to start to translate those asks into actions. Um, so really getting tangible policy changes so that we're kind of, again, going from a top-down approach now. So once we've established all that, then we go directly to administration. And that's when a student's voice really comes into play because as student leaders, um, we often have very direct access to administration. So I mentioned I was the president of our National Sciences Council, so it's a student council for our largest college on campus. Um, college of Natural Sciences, it's about 10,000 undergrads. And I have regular meetings with our associate dean um, and fairly regular meetings with our dean. And so once we had taken all of this, I was able to take all of our work that we had done to you know, our deans, our associate deans, and say, you know, here's what we want to see happen. How can we make this happen? That's when we engage, and I wrote here, engage publicly and privately. So through legislation, through statements, through releasing data and reports but also in those individual meetings, having frank conversations about what the barriers are, what the challenges are, and how we can overcome them. Um, and really emphasizing the role of student needs and centering the students in this conversation. And so that is how we essentially got from, you know, these broader conversations to being able to make, you know, inroads on tenure and promotion, to make inroads on getting the course catalog designations, um, establishing faculty grants, things like that. Um, and I frame this as a cycle because once you've kind of accomplish a few of your key goals and you can sort of reassess, you know, where have we made impacts already um, and what are the next things that we want to focus in on? And so it's kind of a continuous cycle that way too. Thank you, Rohit. Um, that's, I echo some of the comments in the chat, which is that it's such a useful model to have for creating change. Um, driven by students. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to talk a little bit next about the role that I play and the role that the library plays in supporting students. Um, so as the open education librarian, I serve as a coordinator for campus OER activities. So after I started my position in August 2020, it made sense that I should engage student leaders and check in on their priorities and needs. So we scheduled a meeting that following October to really reconnect and brainstorm ways that we could partner and that the library might be able to support their course materials affordability agenda. And that meeting resulted in alignment on a few of the key priorities that Rohit and Alex have already discussed, including those recognition and awards programs for faculty, no cost and low cost course markings, and the importance of acknowledging open education work in our promotion and tenure policies on campus. We then considered the ways that UT libraries in general and that I personally could support their agenda. To enable them to tell compelling stories to faculty and administrators, I look for opportunities to provide them with data that can strengthen their proposals. Sometimes that's national survey data and other times it's local data that I've collected from faculty interviews or surveys or statistics like textbook cost trends from our bookstore here at UT Austin. I also proactively share news, events, and examples from peer institutions that are relevant to their priorities. For example, we look at peer institutions that have implemented no cost and low cost search filters in their course schedules. And I've also facilitated meetings to connect our student leaders to those peers who can share more about how they were able to accomplish specific projects or objectives. 
Uh, these examples and stories can empower them to make bolder asks of our administration um, because we can point to others who have done it successfully. Outside of attempting to support their specific initiatives, though, we found it really valuable to look in the other direction and bring them into our conversations in the libraries. Uh, one of the helpful things that we did in the 2021-22 academic year was to ask a student to join our campus OER working group, which is previously just staff and faculty. So Rohit uh, joined our group and immediately added value by bringing a student perspective to our meetings and projects. He was able to be a sounding board and provide input on things like open education week activities. It's also an easy way to get updates on student activities without scheduling a separate meeting for it. Uh, so we're able to stay apprised of things like the results or outcomes of meetings with administration more quickly. It was also super helpful to be able to include Rohit as part of the review committee for our OER adoption and creation incentive program, um, which is called Open Education Fellows. While our applications are anonymized, Rohit was able to assess the potential impact and value of each proposal with a student's perspective. And he brought insights to the table that faculty and staff who also served on the review committee wouldn't have, like the fact that materials for specific types of courses uh, tend to be really hard to acquire and sometimes prevent students from succeeding. It makes sense to me that students should have a vote in decision making for programs that are intended to benefit them first and foremost, but I don't know if that's a common practice based on my discussions with peers. Um, but if you aren't sure where to start when it comes to supporting your student leaders, I always recommend just asking them, um, what are their priorities, what do they need, and how can you support them? If you don't have regular meetings with them, get something on the calendar so you've got a time to catch up, if nothing else. But I do wanna talk about a specific program that we were able to launch together um, because I think it's a great illustration of our partnership. And you've heard about this a couple of times already. Um, earlier in the presentation, it was mentioned that one of the resolu resolutions that the Senate of College Councils passed was in support of an awards program for faculty. So the Affordable Education Champions Program represents an evolution of that recommendation in that particular piece of legislation. And it's aimed at recognizing instructors who make the choice and often put in a lot of effort to adopt or develop OER and other types of affordable course materials. We originally conceived of it in February 2021 as a potential campaign for Open Education Week and pitched it to student leaders that month, um, which, as you know, is about a month ahead of Open Education Week, which falls in early March. Um, so it gave us just a month to plan and execute it. Uh, you may also remember that February 2021 was the timing of the winter storm that took out power across much of our state for the better part of a week, and our campus was closed for about two weeks. So our timeline ended up being very compressed, but as a result of our ability to adapt and flex with changing circumstances, we were still able to execute the campaign with great results. Um, to me, what's really special about this program is that the nominations are purely student driven. Affordable education champions are only nominated by students enrolled in their courses. And while peer to peer recognition is also important, I've heard from recognized faculty how rare and meaningful it is to get that kind of feedback from students. It's not something that typically comes up in course evaluations and in most cases, um, but it impacts students' ability to, su to succeed um, and overall uh, their well being in a really major way. Because emails to the student body on a campus of our size are limited to very important communications, we had to think creatively about the best way to get the word out about the program. And this is where our fantastic students came in. They created marketing, marketing materials in a variety of formats, including social media, and identified peers in college-based leadership organizations like the Natural Sciences Council that Rohit and Alex were part of to help spread the word. That way, the message about the campaign came from both the Senate of College Councils, as well as those more localized and specialized organizations to reach as many students as possible. As a result, even though we had only a week to collect nominations due to that winter storm, we received about 30 nominations from six different colleges and many different disciplines in that first year. Uh, we had been worried about getting any nominations at all, so this was for us a really big success, and it's thanks to our students' ability to reach their peers and influence action. So once we had the nominations, we convened a committee that included librarians and student leaders from most of the colleges um, with nominations to review them. 
All nominations were anonymized to avoid uh, bias when possible. And we ultimately had many, many impressive nominations that we had to narrow down to just five. We created criteria for the review, and what was most important to us was to evaluate and recognize were those nominations that told clear stories about how the instructor had a direct impact on the student's finances, academic success, or overall well-being as a result of their choice to eliminate or reduce the cost of course materials. Um, and these are just a few of the many quotes that we pulled from submissions that first year. Several nominations specifically said um, that they what they saved in course materials they used to buy groceries and pay for other living expenses. It really showed that our, our idea of the typical student at UT Austin may be one who's living comfortably with support from their family or financial aid. And while that may be some of our students, it's certainly not all of them. We also got a lot of comments that acknowledged the pandemic and the mental and financial hardships that students were facing at that time. Um, and I also appreciated seeing comments that addressed inclusion directly. There's one on the slide that came from a student in a STEM discipline where the cost of textbooks and other materials tends to be on the high side. But once we made the difficult selections of only five uh, champions, we contacted them each to share the good news and seek their permission to be featured in a variety of ways. And this included uh, featured interviews on our library's blog, Text Libris, which was then amplified via social media and by our student partners, um, examples of which you see on the right hand side of this page. We also shared letters of recognition from our vice provost and director of UT libraries. Um, directly with their college deans and department chairs. We hope that this letter would be something that's useful in promotion dossiers alongside the lines on their CVs, including the honors. And we also contacted every instructor who was nominated and shared student quotes with them, even if they weren't selected. Uh, we received a lot of really appreciative replies saying that it felt good to have this effort acknowledged um, and often expanding on the reasons why they made that choice that often comes with extra work. It was really nice to be able to share that feedback with them and reinforce the great work that they do on behalf of their students. So there are overall a lot of benefits to a program like this one. Apart from getting to share that really meaningful feedback and recognition with faculty, this program is a great example of a no budget but high impact campaign. I do think in an ideal world that there would be a monetary award to accompany it, um, but we've seen how much faculty appreciate the recognition even without it. It's also a program that we were able to put together really quickly because the level of commitment on both sides, um, both library staff and student leaders was really high. Uh, everyone understood and respected that they were going to have to act on tight deadlines up front, so we were able to execute at a high level on the deliverables we needed to hit. It also helped that roles and responsibilities were clearly outlined in the early stages of planning. Social media is a tool that we were able to use to get the word out quickly, though I should probably let Rohit and Alex correct me if that required a ton of effort. Um, I think our students are really comfortable with these tools and the best ways to create content that will resonate with their peers. So having students aligned to that role was really helpful for us. If the library had to do that part, we would have had a much smaller audience and require longer lead times to be able to create and schedule promotions. The other reason that we really value this campaign is that along with recognizing our champions, the program allows us to promote greater awareness of OER and course materials affordability issues across the campus community, including students, faculty, and administrators. Each of those audiences is addressed at different stages of the campaign, and it's one facet of an overall approach to awareness building that helps move the needle on a very large campus like ours. It was also a useful tool or rallying point for our usual student leaders to get peers in other leadership organizations involved. For example, while our students in the College of Natural Sciences have historically been very engaged in this advocacy for several years, we hadn't really worked with students in the College of Liberal Arts before, but this campaign opened the door to that. Fortunately, we haven't faced any insurmountable challenges with this program. Um, as a coordinator, I definitely encounter challenges related to scheduling um, and a bit of cat herding because there are so many people involved. 
with evaluating nominations in particular. I think there were about a dozen of us in 2022 for context. Um, it's just a lot of schedules to juggle. And we learned after the first year that the earlier we could get important meetings on the calendar, the better. Um, we also deal with tight turnarounds, partly because we tie our campaign to Open Education Week, but you could probably be a lot more leisurely if you didn't do that. Um, and I mentioned already that I think it would be great to have a centrally funded budget for this program um, to either provide monetary awards or maybe host a reception for our winners. We don't have that currently, but it could be something that we consider if our circumstances change in the future. So that's a little bit about one of our greatest partnership accomplishments. I'm going to turn it back over to Rohit now to close out by talking about how we sustain this work. Yeah, so I do want to make sure there'll be time for questions, but before then, we want to talk about how we are sustaining this work. So now that Alex and I have graduated, um, we don't want all of the work and advocacy and progress that we've made to leave with us. We want it to stay. Um, and there's a few kind of key areas that we highlighted um, or that we've identified as being really crucial to sustaining this. Um, first and foremost, I really do want to emphasize um, our partnership with Ashley and the importance of student staff collaborations like this, um, because student leaders are always in and out, doing different classes, graduating, joining new things, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's really helpful to have a staff member there to provide a sort of two-way accountability, right? So when Alex and I were going through kind of transition stages in winter break, things like that, it was helpful to have Ashley there um, to provide some stability and provide some accountability um, to us as well. And I think that that goes both ways. So that's a big kind of key part of that. Uh, the next thing is kind of formalizing processes and structures. Uh, so we didn't wanna make sure that all of this knowledge just stayed in our heads. Um, so within our organizations, we created kind of guides for future leaders um, and we left really kind of meticulous documentation about everything that we did, every conversation that we've had so that students can really, students that come after us can really easily pick that up and move forward. Um, and also identifying specific individuals within our organizations to lead those efforts forward. Um, so figuring out who is kind of passionate about bringing this on um, and who's going to take this on in the coming years. Um, and then lastly, I wanna emphasize that it was way more than just the three of us right here um, who had a part like had a part in making this happen. Um, so spreading that responsibility across different student leadership groups helps again in another way of accountability. Um, because not only is it the National Sciences Council that's involved in this now going forward, it's the Senate of College Councils, it's student government, it's the liberal arts council, the business, like all of these different groups um, that all have a part to play in this. Um, and so having that uh, extra level of accountability is a key aspect of sustaining the work going forward. Um, so with that, I do want to close and open up the floor for questions, I believe. Yes, thank you so much to both Rohit and Alex. I want to jump into questions for us as well. Rohit, the first couple might be for you because we got some great questions related to the survey that you started off by sharing with us. Um, one person asks, how did you get such a high response rate? So wonderful. Yeah, so we ended up getting a response rate close to about 10% um, of the student body, which especially at an institution as large as ours, we were very happy with that result. Um, but I think the key part for that survey in particular is that we have a lot and a lot, a lot of people working on that and centralized around that survey. Um, so this wasn't just an OER specific survey, like I mentioned, it was everything to do with tuition, budgeting, finances, things like that. Um, and it really takes a massive partnership, not only from our council, but other college councils, the Senate of college councils, um, to put together this survey and push it out. And we're all essentially pushing the same message. You know, we have a centralized data collection survey um, that we each can go in and tweak for our colleges and things like that. Um, but because we were sort of coalesced around that one survey tool, we were able to really push that united message. Um, and so we used our social media was a really big avenue. We sent out little emails to professors asking them to pass along the information to the students in their classes. Uh, we included it in kind of college newsletters that come out. Um, and this is one of the few things I know Ashley mentioned earlier that uh, university-wide emails are pretty hard to get a hold of, but this is one thing that because it is so important for us student leaders um, and that it is so broad and wide reaching that we do actually get the ability to send a campus-wide email out for. Um, but really it's having that united messaging, having that centralized kind of coalition behind it um, helps to reach as many people as possible. Thank you, Rohit. I, a related question that I see in the chat, 
Um, is there a public version of the survey questions that you would be able to share? Um, they are looking for examples to adapt and it looks excellent. Um, and would you, so you just talked about channels. I think that you answered that already. I did share a link to the public report, Rohit, for CT back, but are, is there anywhere that one might find the survey questions themselves? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, um, but I would have to yeah. talk about that. One thing I can add to that too, we attempted uh, like many of you to not reinvent the wheel. So two, I think of the questions that related to course materials affordability were pulled from other surveys, in particular, the Florida Virtual Campus Survey was one that we used as a model and replicated pretty closely. Uh, the unique question was the one related to having uh, faculty choice to use free and low cost course materials recognized in tenure and promotion. So that one I think is one that Rohit may have authored directly. Yes, I think also um, within the survey report and kind of like the forward, there might be a link to the raw data, which um, has the questions, but that might be restricted to UT emails. So I, I'm also not sure about that. Got it. Well, we'll look into that. If we are able to find a public version, what I can do is include a link to that at the end of this presentation where attendees will find links to other relevant resources um, on the topics we presented on and I'll upload a new version to the shared folders that folks will be able to access that. Um, I do want to address another question that I see, um, and this one is, I think, for Alex. So related to the um, legislation passed to, to promote accessibility statements in uh, promotion dossiers, they ask, is there a menu of accessibility options for faculty to choose from? And are there incentives to adding more accessible features in ensuing iterations of the courses? So um, as far as the menu, if I'm understanding correctly, there is not, and that was kind of something we came to um, through conversations with the vice provost and things like that. Um, I met with her and she just said, the more flexibility you can give, the more likely it is to get adopted. And if it gets adopted, the more likely it is to be put into you know, the whole university. So there is not actually, that was intentional, but your university may be more open to that. Um, I think suggestions are great, um, but currently as it is, it's pretty, pretty flexible. Um, as far as motivation and incentives, the point of this is, kind of that if they leave it blank, it sends a message, you know? So the point of this is that the professors see that right under the personal statement now that they have to fill out, there is a statement saying, what are you doing to create accessibility in your classroom or make your classroom more accessible? So the incentive with that really goes with, it just brings it to light and it focuses on rewarding the professors who are doing something and not punishing, but also not rewarding professors who are also not doing anything, you know? so. Um, that is the incentive in place. Um, going forward, I would love for it to be more restrictive, but frankly, like I said, we were just wanting to get something on the table and in writing, which we did manage to do. Um, so going forward, that is going to be a great precedent that we can use to say, you know, this has been important. We've been able to do it before. Let's put some more tangible incentives in place. So any progress is good progress. Thank you, Alex. I see one other question in the chat so far. Uh, Rebecca says, this work is phenomenal with replicable models for how to lead with and through student advocacy in the OER and low cost space. It also results in curricular innovation and reinvigoration. Do you make that connection in how you bring faculty in to deeper engagement with OER? I will take a first quick pass at that, but I'm curious about how, um, how others might respond. This comes up a lot in my conversations with faculty. It often, I am not the person who coined this, but it is very true that often you come to OER for the affordability and you stay for the pedagogy. And very often when faculty engage me as a librarian to talk about OER, they start that conversation because they're really enthusiastic about saving their students money. But when they learn about the affordances of OER to make their curriculum more innovative, to modify it, to better meet the needs of their course, they are extra excited and they stick around to think about how they could do more with that. I'm curious, Rohit and Alex, in your conversations with faculty as students, is that something that's come up for you or is it mostly focused on, on savings? Yeah. 
I would say so. I'll be real quick. Um, because especially it was actually funny. Some of our, the people who won our awards were actually involved in writing like the chemistry textbook that I mentioned earlier. And we have had those conversations because being able to pair down a huge book in just for the class make course material better and everyone actually reads the textbook then so that has been a very important thing to discuss with professors since it's a reality that they can acknowledge when you're able to pare down everything yeah i would agree i think there there were aspects of that when we were having conversations with faculty um, but i think particularly when it comes to curriculum innovation things that's when we sort of lean on Ashley a bit more um, and we approach it with, you know, you know, here's why students care. You know, we trust that you're going to teach us the material and that, you know, we're going to learn however you decide. Um, but what's really important is that we're going to be able to do that without having to pay too much out of pocket. Uh, so there's definitely an aspect of, you know, in acknowledging the reality that a lot of students just aren't buying the materials um, and how that's going to impact the curriculum. But when it comes to more curriculum innovation, I'd say we definitely leaned on Ashley more there. And we're right at noon, so I'm going to go ahead and let people um, wrap up if, if need be. The only other question that I thought um, we might want to address is where will the slides be available? And Ashley, you kind of mentioned that. Yes, thank you for, for making that back up. So I've already uploaded it into the shared folder that was um, shared with me. I don't know if that's where all attendees will have access to our materials or if it's elsewhere, but Cynthia, if you recommend it, I'm also happy just to share a link to it now. Yes, that'd be great, Ashley. Yeah, you got it. I will share a link in chat. Thank you all for coming and for such wonderful questions um, as we went along. I can stick around for a few more minutes, but I know that you all have very busy days ahead. And I'll do the same. So if anybody else needs anything, let us know. We're getting lots of thank yous. Great job, you guys. Um, that was perfect. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.